Uh, listen, uh, the president's been out around the country talking about uh, uh, the economy and how we need to get back on track and salvaging the economy. We thought it'd be a good day to have our friend Dr. Peter Morisi come in. He, of course, is a University of Maryland economist, an all-round good guy. How are you, Dr. Morisi? I'm fine. I'm fine. Remember those cartoons with, you know, you guys, the guy's out in a rowboat and he's trying to drill a hole in the bottom to make it better? <laughs> yeah. Well, and so you, you, uh, you look at the president making these speeches. What do you draw? Do you hear anything out there in what the president, I mean, his first speech was like an hour and six minutes long. Did you hear anything new, different, something that uh, caused you to stop and pause and say, well, maybe that's something we should investigate? No. It's the same old, same old, and, you know, the president is really up against it now. You know, we've been talking as if we've had a slow recovery. You know, we're growing at 2%. Well, in fact, the economy slowed down a great deal uh, since the election. Uh, a lot of the bad news was postponed until after the election. He was very skillful at getting the tax increases scheduled for after the election, the sequester uh, showdown after the election and so forth. But, you know, and he wants to blame this, this, this slowdown in growth that we're going through now uh, on sequestration, but the tax increases will more than double the spending cuts. I mean, uh, he's got a very peculiar way of adding and subtracting and so forth. That's one of the reasons the list for Fed is so short. I think you could he could count on one hand the number of competent economists he knows. Uh, Peter Morisi is our guest. And follow him on Twitter, by the way, P. Morisi, the number one, P. because apparently there's another P. Morisi out there. You don't want to get the wrong one. You don't want to get the plumber. Yeah, no, that's not. Uh, I, when he's going on this road show. He's giving these speeches. As you just mentioned, he's not really talking about anything in particular. Is this really just politics, and is that what our economy needs right now? Yeah, he's drawing a line between himself and the Republicans in, in the ways that would be most favorable to him. You know, saying, well, the top 1% is getting all the money. Well, that's because of his own policies, like Dodd Frank is enriching the banks, uh, but in any case, uh, he's he's trying to say, you know, I'm here to promote economic justice to get you a better piece of the pie. I'm for the middle class. It's a lot of hand waving, but with these sophisticated economic issues, you know, they work. And so, really, this is the kickoff to the next congressional campaign, the 2014 uh, election. It's, and and also with all the scandals in Washington. And the insidious things the attorney general is doing, like going down there, the re Democrats have targeted Texas for, for voter organization. And, you know, they're welcome to do that. That's part of the game. But now uh, targeting Texas's voting laws uh, at the same time? Uh, oh, come now. I mean, it, can Mr. Holder get any more political? Let's see. He's rifled the files of, of AP. He's persecuted a Fox reporter. Uh, he has used the IRS, uh, excuse me, the IRS has targeted people that he doesn't like, and he can't seem to find the resources to get to the bottom of it. But he's got the lawyers to go down and sue Texas. You know, we really need something other than a po cheap political hack as an attorney general. I mean, between a spineless Supreme, you know, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court from the other side and this guy, you know, I tremble the notion of getting any protection of my civil rights out of this government. I okay. want to. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, no. don't, I know. I'm not holding back. By the way. Well, yeah, I noticed you weren't. <laughs> You've had your post toasties this morning. Hey, listen. I want to add, talk about the Walmart issue that uh, is uh, so much in the news here locally. You know, uh, the, basically, the the district council has said, uh, "Look, Walmart. We think you should pay a higher minimum wage. We think you should pay twelve fifty an hour, while the rest of of the city and employers." pays only eight twenty five. There's another proposal out there that would raise the minimum wage in the District of Columbia to about ten twenty five an hour. And I even noticed that on the national level, Senator Harkin is talking about maybe raising the minimum wage uh, across the board nationwide. Talk about that and, and, and specifically, though, address this Walmart bill. Uh, let me talk about two things then. First of all, uh, economists don't like minimum wages. If we raise the minimum wage, we will have more unemployment because it is possible to substitute machines for people, even in very low-level jobs. Now, if, but if we're going to have a minimum wage, you can make an argument that it is now woefully low by historical standards adjusted for inflation. Now, what Senator Harkin wants to do is kind of remindful of Senator Warren from, from Massachusetts, who wants to have zero interest rates on student loans so they'll never be repaid. Uh, this is similar. It's just silly to raise it up to, say, 10.50 an hour. 
Uh, with regard to Walmart, it's not just Walmart. It's a few other big box stores who are captive, like, for example, Macy's will have to pay it, you know, after they've made the investment. Now, what this would do is basically hurt the uh, uh, people of the District of Columbia in two ways. Believe it or not, Walmart and Starbucks are very similar places. They both offer limited health care. Uh, it's just Walmart gets a lot of bad, bad press. And they're really denying people in the district the opportunity for a little bit better jobs uh, than they could have in competing small enterprises. And the, and the other thing is, is they're denying the people uh, uh, who shop in the district, who don't have a lot of money, who aren't in the, in the more prosperous neighborhoods, the opportunity to go to Walmart and get very low prices. Because these, these neighborhood retailers aren't terribly good buyers because they don't have size. They're not terribly efficient. So they both charge higher prices, and they don't take care of their employees as well. Uh, they're not in a position to buy health care in quite the same way that Walmart is. Uh, they're smoking dope over there on the city council, thinking they could pay twelve fifty an hour. And they have this illusion that somehow or other every job in America for, uh, that you work 40, 40 hours a week is to provide for a family of four, a stay-at-home wife, and a $20,000 health care policy on top of it. It's just silly what they want to do. But, you know, the caliber of elected officials in the District of Columbia would be comical if it wasn't so tragic. They are just a bunch of incompetent fools. I mean, look at the public schools, the kind of money we pay for the public schools. The reason we don't have a more vibrant middle class in the city is people simply don't trust the schools. That is a fundamental breakdown in confidence of government. When you look at the kind of money, this isn't Detroit. This city has the highest per capita taxes, you know, per income, excuse me, to tax from of just about, you know, any state in the, in, in the country. I mean, it is a state in, ter- in those terms, and it has enormous resources, and it can't run a competent state university, and it can't run a, a competent public schools. I mean, and, and now they're doing this. I mean, that's yeah. the basic problem, is we have lousy public officials. Peter Morisi, uh, first of all, if they are smoking dope on the D.C. City Council, I'm sure it's because they were set up. Uh, but meanwhile... Well, it's medicinal. It's medicinal. Yeah. They, got a, they got a prescription from a, from a Ph.D. in social history out of the University of, of Central Dakota or something. Well, uh, listen, speaking of universities, that's actually where I wanted to pivot. I mean, you live your life on a campus oh. there, University of Maryland, and we're getting this report out of this uh, Jacksonville, the speech that the president gave. He always goes to a college campus to give these speeches. Have well, you noticed sure, that? We get lots of liberals to get their students out to cheer. Well, and apparently it's a, a very, very uh, concerted effort to keep conservative college students, such as they are, out of the room. We're getting a report. Um, actually, this is from the University of Central Missouri, the speech he gave uh, on, on Wednesday, or excuse me, on Tuesday. Uh, apparently, Republicans or, or students who showed up with Tea Party t-shirts and other uh, patriotic or Republican-inspired clothing were turned away at the door under the guise of security. I think it's, by, by the way, remarkable that patriotic clothing is an indicator that you're a Republican, but I'll, I'll set that aside for a moment. Well, it is true. Well, do you, do you see college students who hold right-of-center positions on your campus there being well, discriminated think, against like this? N- not to my knowledge, but I mean, I ha- we do have a very liberal administration. I mean, r- we're coming right off the Supreme Court decision on affirmative action, so splashing across our college web pages the benefits of, of emphasizing diversity in admissions. I mean, the, the, the universities are in rebellion. It's not just my right. university, it's the culture. It's the, a- it's the absolute culture of universities these days to be that way. I mean, you know, it's like, uh, it's like Garrison Keillor were the Grand Chancellor of all the state universities. But I think that we shouldn't be surprised that they would exclude people with Tea Party t-shirts and so forth. That's a little bit in your face to the president on the one yeah. hand, but on the other, I mean, we have a president of the United States who meets with the, with the president of the Irish Union. Three days later, they're targeting conservatives. If he will let his tax people without correction, right. and there has been no correction, audit and destroy the businesses of conservatives, people who go to just simply go to conservative business, uh, civic meetings. That's what this comes down to. That's what those local organizations are. And uh, are we surprised that he'll keep right. their kids out of rallies? Come on. We, we I mean, got we're it. dealing here you know, with the kinds of tactics we saw in the 1930s. Let's right. be clear. We've got to leave it right there because we're way over. But uh, thanks, Peter Marisi. Good